to DRJ Spring 2019. Woo! Are you guys excited to be here? I can't tell. Our theme is managing risk in an uncertain world. We, the Disaster Recovery Journal team, is pleased that you have chosen to celebrate our 60th conference. Amazing. <laughs> DRJ has been setting the standard for business continuity and resiliency professionals twice a year for 30 years. Can we celebrate that? 30 years? 30 years. We have some millennials in the audience that are probably 30 years old. We have over 900 attendees nearly 1,200 continuity professionals that serve a broad range of domestic and international environments, which means you have increased your opportunities to network and to build relationships and to find strategies and solutions for your companies. For those of you who may not know me, I have a background in Homeland Security and Emergency Management and bring to you over 10 years of experience so I love continuity and crisis management professionals as you guys contribute a lot to what I do every single day. Risk and uncertainty. When I think about risk, it's future state. It hasn't happened yet. It can be tangible and it can be intangible. It can be internal to your organization or external. So then what's uncertainty? It's something that causes us to feel doubt, to have apprehension, to be suspicious, to be on edge. Well, why are we on edge? Well, when I think about the crisis of the Boeing 737 MAX, the New Zealand active shooter, the shortage of pilots in aviation, and they're saying that by 2037, we will need another 790,000 pilots. That's a lot. The college admission scandal, and yet another prediction of a financial crisis. And that is why managing risk in an uncertain world is such a relevant topic. So, we're all continuity professionals, right? Yes, we are, which means we like to be proactive and prepared. So, that's my job for today, is to keep you informed and prepared. On your tables, you have a white sheet of paper, and it gives you an app called Slido.com. So go ahead and feel free to go to Slido.com and open the app. Fortunately for you, you do not have to download anything. Just click open. This is your opportunity to ask questions and to make comments so that our speakers today can make sure that they address your questions and your answers during their conversations. Well, how do we do that? Well, we all need Wi-Fi. So luckily, we have Disney Convention Center guest Wi-Fi. No password is needed. Go ahead and turn on your phones and get your Wi-Fi plugged in. And here's the third reason why you need your phones today. Because, of course, we have to get on social media. So do me a favor. Take 20 seconds. Shake the person's hand to your right and to your left. Find out why they're here. And if you're on the aisle, that's even better. <laughs> Take a photo, ask permission, and use hashtag DRJSpring. I'll give you 20 seconds. Disaster Recovery Journal, 
and DRJ Spring 2019 Gold Sponsor on top. And we are excited because tonight they are hosting a hospitality in the Casitas Courtyard. I had a chance to talk to Ann yesterday. Trust me, you do not want to miss this hospitality tonight at 6.30 p.m. So be sure to be there. Additionally, I want to acknowledge our silver and bronze sponsors. All of their logos are here right behind me, so please make sure you stop by the exhibitor's booth, get to, get to know them, shake their hands, figure out what they're doing here and what they have to offer you. Okay, we have to give a special shout out. So, the first person that I want to shout out today is Bob Arnold, the president of Disaster Recovery Journal. I also want to make sure that we acknowledge Richard Arnold, the CEO and publisher, Patty Fitzgerald, the conference director and my boss, Rose Shatro, the registration manager, and last but not least, my great friend, John Seals, the editor-in-chief. Let's give this team a round of applause. We also have the DRJ Editorial Advisory Board and Executive Council here. Can you guys wave for the audience? Oh, they're all right here. Thank you, guys. So it's important that you guys know who this team is because they provide the editorial as well as strategic direction of the magazine. So when you think about where are we going, what are we doing, how are we getting there, DRJ has a board of advisors that helps them to think about that. So be sure to check in with these folks and get to know them. Without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker who is a dynamic individual. So I asked them before, Today, I said, what's your most memorable crisis moment that you can remember in your work experience? And he said, well, it's kind of hard, but one comes to mind. I was on a compliance project with Procter and & Gamble, and there was a lot of change, a lot of stress, a lot of frustration. We were behind schedule. We were in stressful meetings. We were trying to talk to the business teams and the IT teams, and they can't communicate. And the next thing I know, my manager walked in the room and said, stop! At the end of the day, Procter & Gamble does one thing. We sell soap. So we're not going to war. We're not going to battle. We sell soap. So let's get back to the heart of what we do. And that allowed him to recharge and to reset. Our first speaker is the world's first humor engineer. And for some of you, that may sound like an oxymoron. However, he teaches people how to get better results while having more fun. He has worked with over 35,000 professionals at over 250 organizations, including Procter & Gamble, Microsoft, and the Federal Bureau of Investigations. He is a best-selling author. He has been featured on the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and Fast Company, and his TEDx talk has been viewed over two million times. He has delivered programs in 50 states, 20 countries, and one planet. That would be Earth. He loves the color orange, and he is obsessed with chocolate. So he gave me two leadership lessons that he lives by. And the first is he recognizes that leadership is not a one hat that fits all. You have to be adaptable. His second leadership lesson is to leave things better than you found them so the people that you work with are better. Even to include, he cleans up at his friend's houses so his presence leaves a positive impact. I don't know about you, but I'm inviting him to my house. So please help me introduce and welcome, because this is his first conference at DRJ, Andrew Tarvin. Humor engineer of Humor That Works. Meeting on your feet. The vital leadership skill of improvisation. Andrew Carbon. The best career advice I ever received 
uh, was from my manager at Procter Gamble. He said that it is better to beg for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. Now, I'm in front of a room full of risk managers in some ways, and you're like, no, that seems like terrible advice. Uh, but uh, he said it's better to beg for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. And for me, it was incredibly empowering advice because he gave it to me on my first week on the job at Procter & Gamble. I had just graduated from The Ohio State University with a degree in computer science and engineering. Go Bucks, I.O. Uh, and because I should tell you that uh, I am a nerd. If you're wondering what type of nerd, the answer is yes. <laughs> Computer, math, sci-fi, Dungeons and Dragons, Star Wars, Star Trek, Starbucks, all of them. <laughs> right? But most specifically, I'm an engineer. And as an engineer, I've always been obsessed with efficiency, ever since I can remember, or really since before I can remember, because I was born three weeks early. So apparently, even in the womb, I was like, I don't need a full nine months. I'm ready to go right now. Right, let's do this, Mom. Obsessed with efficiency. I remember in the uh, fifth grade getting really excited when I discovered that if you put all the light silverware together when you load a dishwasher, you can save about 20 seconds on the unload. Yeah. And I got so excited that I wrote up a five point plan of how to efficiently load and unload a dishwasher, which my family promptly ignored. <laughs> right? In school, I decided that smart for me was getting a 93% in all of my classes because a 93% was the lowest grade you could get and still get an A. Got to the point that if I got a 94, 95, or worst case scenario, 100%, I was upset. Because it meant that I did more work than I had to do. <laughs> right? Obsessed with efficiency. So that's why I went to Ohio State. That's why I got a degree in computer science and engineering. And that's why when I graduated, I started working at P&G as an IT project manager. And it was on that first week on the job that my boss told me that it's better to beg for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. Now, of course, being a kind of fresh out of school student, um, new hire, I looked at my boss and I was like, you know, I want to see if he actually means that. Right? I decided I'm going to test him. I'm going to do some things that maybe I should have to uh, beg for forgiveness for. Right? I didn't like do anything like keep, steal company secrets or anything like that, but I started to add jokes at the end of my email. And I started to teach improv to my uh, project management resources. And the thing that I did that I thought for sure I was going to have to beg for forgiveness for was I proclaimed myself the corporate humorist of P&G. I got uh, business cards made. I started blogging about it. I assumed eventually someone from like HR or legal was going to come up and be like, hey, you can't just create your own job title. Uh, but no one ever did. Instead, people started referring to me as the corporate humorist. And so I started to blog even more about it. I started to research about the value of humor in the workplace, and improv, and business, happiness, and productivity. And I realized that as an engineer, humor, improvisation, it helps with one of the hardest resources we have to manage, which is other humans. So that's what I want to talk about this morning, is how we can use improvisation, some of the tenets from improvisation, to be better leaders, to be able to lead on our feet in a world of uncertainty. And I'm incredibly excited to be here. First of all, we're, or, we're in Orlando. Orlando, Book of Mormon fans, right? Fantastic spot to be. We're here at the Disney World Resorts, right? Exciting. Uh, I got an orange wristband. You already heard in my bio that uh, they love the I love the color orange, so I got orange here, so I'm ecstatic already. Uh, I've got like 20,000 steps, and that was just getting to the conference room today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a massive, beautiful place. Uh, this, this place is fantastic. You should definitely go for a walk. There's a really cool pool with a slide out there. You can play ping pong and uh, cornhole and all that kind of good stuff. So I'm excited to be here, physically here. And I'm excited to be here with all of you. Right? Disaster recovery, business continuity. I will admit, when uh, I was first talking with Patty, taking a look at the website, I saw BCDR all over the website. I was like, this place loves British Columbia and the Dominican Republic. <laughs> Love it. Or the like shorthand text, because doctors. <laughs> I don't know, B, C, D, R. No, but I'm excited because right, you guys have incredible work, and, and Vanessa's already alluded to all of the amount that's happened just in 2019 so far that you have to account for. So I'm excited to be here to share with you a couple of ideas. Now, I am a project manager, which means that every meeting that I'm in has to start with an agenda. So this is what we're gonna talk about for the next hour or so. Uh, I'm going to talk about some stuff. Uh, you guys are going to do some things. 
Uh, I'll answer questions about it all. Uh, I'll close on some ideas, and then I'm going to stop talking about anything. Uh, so hopefully you're comfortable with that next hour. Uh, right? Hopefully you, you, you can trust me to say we're going to curate this experience. Because what I will say is that uh, I have never actually been in your position. Right? I was a project manager, I understand a little bit about risk management, but I've never actually been in your role. I've never actually been in your company. What I have done is work with over 250 organizations all around the world on how to be more effective. And so my challenge to you is to be on the lookout for one idea, one concept, maybe it's more, maybe at least one idea, one thing that you want to do differently as a result of the time we spend here together this morning. Because we're going to have some fun. You guys are welcome to laugh. We're going to have some interaction. We're going to have a good time. More important to me as an engineer is that you do something differently as a result of us spending time together. Does that make sense? Be on the lookout for that one thing. Maybe it's brand new to you, or maybe it's even a reminder of something that you knew before. And when you find that one thing, make sure that you write it down, maybe even tweet it out, hashtag DRJ Spring. Right? Share that so that you actually implement it when you go back to work next week or later this week, or whenever it is you're going back to work, probably in the break, right? Um, so that's my, my challenge to you. To help with that, as mentioned, we do have an interactive uh, process up. Uh, we have the ability to ask questions. So if you go to slido.com, insert the, the code DRJ Spring. Uh, feel free to ask questions as you go through. At the end, I'm going to answer some questions, so feel free to go ahead, and if something comes up in the middle of me talking about something, write it down and share it there, because we'll get to those towards the end. So certainly feel free to do that. Now, the topic today is around leadership. So if we're going to talk about leadership, probably important to make sure that we define leadership. So I want you to think about, I'm not really curious about the definition of leadership, but I want you to think of a leader. A leader you admire, specifically. A leader you admire... Think of that person. They could be someone that you know, maybe a, a former manager, maybe a current manager, maybe someone kind of out in the world that you know of. Um, and I want you to start to think about why do you admire that person as a leader? Is it because they call whenever they need to? Think of the phone, right? Uh, is it because they uh, have strong values? What is it about that leader that you admire? So someone from this section right here, who is the leader you're thinking of and why do you admire them? Anyone willing to share? You can just shout it out and I'll repeat it. Anyone from this section right now? Yeah, in the back. Contributor and as a human, right? Hopefully. Uh, fantastic. Excellent. Someone from over here, a leader you admire and why? Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. Wow, right? So a manager you had a few years ago or years ago that would look you in the face, tell you the bold faced truth, and you would be better for it, right? Someone who is honest, authentic with you. Right? So as we think about the leaders, we recognize that leadership is not a position. Right? We didn't name these people specifically because they were leaders. We were talking about the human attributes that they have. Because is it possible to be a leader, or a manager, we'll say, is it possible to be a manager but a terrible leader? Absolutely. Right? <laughs> It is possible. We recognize that leadership is not a position. Leadership is an attitude, and specifically, it is an attitude in action. And that action piece is really, really important because there is a difference between intention and action. I don't think anyone wakes up in the morning and is like, you know what? I want to lead a boring meeting today. <laughs> or, ooh, I want to accidentally re reply to all, telling the reply to all chain not to reply to all. Ooh, oh, oh, I know. I'm going to burn popcorn in the break room. <laughs> right? No one wakes up with that intention. But does it happen? Right? Every single day. There's a difference between intention and action. And what do we judge other people by? Their intentions or their actions? Their actions, right? It's the only thing that we can see. What do we judge ourselves by? Our intentions. Have you guys ever felt good about yourself just because of something you thought? 
Right? I remember, uh, so I live in New York City now. I remember when I first moved to New York City, I'd been there just a couple of months. Um, it was a long day. I was still at PNG at the time. It had been a long day, so I, I get on the train. It's a little bit crowded, but I find a seat. Get there, I'm tired, weary. Uh, get on the seat, we get to the next stop, and on the train steps uh, an older woman. And she looked even more tired, even more weary than me. And I thought to myself, I was like, you know what? I should get up and give her my seat, right? I'm a young, spry person, despite the fact that I just used the word spry. <laughs> Um, but I'm strong, I'm able, I'm tired, but you know what, I should still, I should, she needs a seat more than I do, I should get up and give her my seat. Now I didn't do it, <laughs> but I felt good about myself for having thought it. Right? There is a difference between intention and action and what we actually see, and in that gap between intention and action is what happens, what I call, unleadership. The things that we do that accidentally demotivate the people around us. And I'm not talking about one, this could be if you are a manager of others, fantastic. But this is also if you're brand new in an organization, you yourself can be a leader, right? Leadership is not a position, it is an attitude and action. So you can be a leader, but you also might be doing these things of unleadership. Unleadership is things like this, an unleader fantasizes. Uh, I want to come down very quickly uh, and see, uh, excuse me, what did you want to be when you were a little kid? What did you want to be when you grew up? A doctor. A doctor. Fantastic. Did you become a doctor? No. No. What happened? I, I couldn't deal with chemistry. Couldn't deal with chemistry. That's a good reason not to become a doctor. Very smart. Excellent. What did you want to be when you were a little kid? George Lucas. George Lucas? Are you George Lucas? No. Oh, okay. Cool. Uh, I was going to say you look way different on TV. Uh, all right, excellent. Uh, what happened? Why did you not become like a director or the creator of Star Wars? Uh, I like to eat. You like to eat, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah, and you didn't want to start, right? It didn't necessarily have the right business plan for you. Perfect. What did you want to be when you were a little kid? What did you want to do when you grow up? An astronaut. Very cool. Are you an astronaut? No. No. What happened? Air Force wouldn't let me be a pilot. Uh, because of behavior? Oh, uh, hey, <laughs> Superstar. But that was a fantasy, right? Because I clearly never worked out, right? Never got bigger, right? It was a fantasy. I never actually put it into practice, never actually created a plan. A little while after that, I wanted to become an international hip hop superstar. Uh, I recently found one of my old rap notebooks and discovered why that never happened. Because uh, one of the rhymes in it was hydrogen plus hydrogen plus oxygen too bonded together with covalent glue. What do you get? Just a thing called water. Yeah, it's steaming up, and it's only getting hotter. <laughs> Not a huge market for chemistry rap. <laughs> right, but it was a fantasy. I never really worked hard to put it into practice. An unleader fantasizes. They have maybe all these brilliant ideas, but never actually take action on any of them. Maybe you guys have this person that you know, like a friend of yours on Facebook. Where one week it's like, oh my god, I'm so excited, I'm starting my, my new business, or I'm, I just registered for nursing school. And you're like, oh, that's awesome, congratulations, go be a nurse, it'll be amazing. And then you check in on them a week later, and they're like, actually, no, I'm not going to do that, I'm selling essential oils now. <laughs> and like, all right, cool, yeah, sell your essential oils, build a business, that kind of stuff. You check in a week later, and they're like, nope, done with it, I'm doing goop. <laughs> you guys know what goop is, I don't even know what it is, right? Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow is saying, Right? But all they're doing is always changing what they want to do. It's always a fantasy, but never a reality. That demotivates people because then when you have that next brilliant idea, they're like, yeah, but it's never going to happen. Demotivates people. Next, an unleader alienates. We do a lot of work with uh, Microsoft on some of their recent hires, people that are about two or three years within the organization. And uh, we do some programs because they're their high potential. And the problem with their high potentials in some cases at some companies is that people will get results, but they'll do it by leaving a trail of destruction behind them. And you guys have probably, many of you have been in the industry and in your role long enough to know that relationships matter. 
things all come back together. So you can't do things alone. You can't alienate the people around you. Because when you do, when you get the results at the expense of the relationships of other people, you are being efficient, but not necessarily long-term effective. And that is unleadership. Next, an unleader inhibits. Uh, let's see. Uh, you, sir, here on the end, you're looking down and checking things out. Can you help me out for a second? Can you stand up here? Can you come up the show? Come on, give him a round of applause at the end of the day. Yeah. Right there, that's perfect. Uh, now, can you lift your right leg? Yes. Fantastic. Put it about six inches in front of you. Cool. Yes. Yeah, set it down. Shift your weight to that leg. Perfect. Now lift the left leg. Put it about six inches in front. Yes. Yeah, set it down. Well, right. I could just say, could you walk here? <laughs> right. Or I'm micromanaging the entire process. Right. Inhibiting our people, micromanaging the process, rather than saying, hey, here's your goal. Use your natural capability and the things that you've learned over your experience of the ability to walk, walk here, right? You can do that, yeah, you can try right there. Um, right, I could say do that, or I could try to make sure he's doing everything exactly the way that I would do it, right? Give him a round of applause, you guys. <laughs> right, when we try to dictate exactly how people do things, rather than leveraging their own strengths, they become demotivated, because it's no longer about autonomy, it's no longer about self-efficacy, it's about you trying to turn them into a robot. Right? We do this sometimes, even with simple things like email. Right? As a project manager, I want to send emails that are like, do this thing. Right? You shouldn't need the context, I'm in charge, do this thing. But we can't send emails like that. Right? We have to send emails like, hey so and so, hope you had a great weekend. Anyway, I was hoping you could do this thing by this day for this reason. Oh, I'll see you at the happy hour later. Right? Cheers, best, regards, sincerely yours truly, XOXO. Right? That second one is much, much longer. Right? The first one is efficient, but the second one is long-term, more effective. Right? That's the mindset that we have to have. We have to understand the human components of things. We have to not inhibit the people around us. Next, an unleader lies. Uh, I will admit that this one is a little bit controversial, but I want you to tell me uh, whether or not this is true. If you say you are going to do something, and then you do not do it, did you lie? If you say you're going to do something, and then you do not do it, did you lie? Yes. Right? I think so. Not maliciously, probably not even intentionally, but technically you lie. So if you're like, I'm going to get that email to you by Wednesday, and it is now Friday, you haven't sent it, technically you lie. And that's not a big deal for that one single time that you do it, but if you start to do it over time, it stacks up and people start to not believe what you're going to say. Quick side note, do you guys know the number one reason for why meetings start late? The number one reason? Meetings that start late. Right? Not in the context of that you're running from one meeting to another and one meeting starting late so the next one's going to start late. That's part of the problem. But imagine this scenario. Your meeting is supposed to start at 9 a.m. I am coming to your meeting. It is 9.07. I walk in. The meeting has not started yet. I feel, whew, man, I am lucky. I can sit down, kind of relax, all good to go. It's 9.07. We're good. Or imagine that I've been here since 8.55. I'm one of those people that's like, if you're five minutes early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. I imagine I'm one of those people. I'm sitting there at 8.55. At 9.03, I'm checking my watch. 9.05, I'm checking my watch. 9.07, hey, we still haven't started yet. And that tells me, next time, I don't have to get here on time. If I walk in at 9.07, we haven't started yet, I don't have to get here on time. Versus, let's say it's 9 o'clock or 9.07, you started at 9 and I walk in, now I gotta be like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, there's the traffic, oh, I kind of, like, I feel bad. I'm like, ooh, next time I better get here right at 9, because I know that they're gonna start at 9. Right? We wanna make sure that we're teaching people how to treat us, and we do that through our behavior, because they can't see our intentions, they can only see our actions. Now, I'll tell you, it got to the point at PNG that I started starting my meetings on time, no matter how many people were in the room. I only had to present to an empty room once. It was weird. Especially for the first person that walked in. <laughs> they walked in, I'm already in the middle of my presentation, like, are you insane? What's going on? 
But it was a story to kind of say, no, I'm starting meetings on time. I'm setting this as a precedent, right? When we lie, these micro lies built up over time, people stop to believe even the bigger things that we say. The last one is that an unleader settles. The fact that you are in this room means that you are probably doing pretty well. Pretty decent, at least compared to maybe some of your Facebook friends or people around the U.S. and particularly around the world, you all are doing well. The fact that you can take some time, invest in yourselves, come here, learn, grow, engage, network, probably doing at least okay pretty well. So it can be easy when you start to compare yourself to other people, you can start to let off the gas a little bit. You can say, oh, well, compared to the people that I went to high school with on Facebook, I'm doing great. So you start to settle a little bit. You settle into what Thomas Harrell called excellent mediocrity. You guys are excellent at being mediocre. Because you're comparing yourself to other people instead of your own potential. I was talking with a friend of mine not too long ago, and he said that um, some people's definition of hell is that on the day you die, you meet the person you could have been. That's like deep for a Monday morning, right? <laughs> on the day you die, you meet the person you could have been. Right? And I'm not saying that it's you, I'm just saying that unleaders do that, they settle. Because when we know someone, when we see someone with so much potential and we see them not fulfilling that potential, it becomes demotivating. Especially if that person is helping to lead an organization. Because if they're not going to try, why should I? If they're not giving it their best, why should I? Unleader settles. And ultimately, an unleader fails. Because of all these things. They fail over time because they demotivate the people around them. And it is my belief that leadership, uh, unleadership is on the rise because of the way that the wor world is changing, because we live in a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. You guys all know this, right? We know that it's volatile. We know that the world is constantly changing. We know that this used to be a computer. Now this is, right? And most of you in this room are like, even that's an old picture. Right? That's an iPhone 4. We don't have headphone jacks anymore. <laughs> Right? Technology is constantly changing. Fashion is changing. This used to be fashionable, I think. Right now, something like this is. I don't know. Right? I'm an engineer. I just went into a suit store and I was like, make me look better. Right? I don't know what fashion is. Right? Families change. This is my family growing up. That's me in the, the middle, down at the end. I'm the baby. This practice makes perfect. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this was me, uh, my family, a few years ago. We were at the Grand Canyon. My dad passed away like six or seven years ago. Things change. Actually, by curiosity, by show of hands, how many of you have added someone new to your family within, say, the last 12 months? Maybe through a marriage or through a kids or through something like that, right? Many of you, right? How many of you have lost someone in your family? Right? Life changes. Our relationships change constantly changing. Leadership has also changed. Leadership used to be about efficiency. Made sense. In the Industrial Revolution, if you worked in a factory, if you could take a motion that was like this and turn it to just this, you save millions of dollars. Efficiency made sense. But we now live in a knowledge economy where people's emotions impact their ability to get things done. So it's no longer about efficiency, it is about effectiveness. Right? The world has changed. The rate of change is also increasing. It took 46 years for electricity to penetrate 25% of the U.S. market. It took 26 years for TV to do it. it. took seven for the internet. And now we know memes rise and fall overnight. Do you guys remember when we spent about a week arguing about the color of a dress? Right? That feels like ages ago. Right? Things rise and fall overnight. The speed of change is quickening. It's increasing. So we live in a volatile world. It's also an uncertain world. Some futurists estimate that 50% of the jobs that exist today will not exist in 10 years. How do you plan for something where you don't know? That's what you guys all do, right? In a world of uncertainty, right? So you understand the uncertainty piece. It is a complex world. This device in our pockets is a result of hundreds of companies coming together over with thousands of patents. 
I have a degree in computer science and engineering. I have no idea how the zeros and ones in my pocket go to outer space and end up in your pocket. It's complex. I have no idea how it works and all the intricacies that happen with it. And it's an ambiguous world. Success is sometimes hard to know, especially within disaster preparedness, business continuity. Because you're like, am I, have we not had a disaster recently because I am amazing or because it's the calm before the storm? When you go into work every single day, it's hard to know, was today a successful day? Did I do the things that I needed to do? Sometimes hard, it's sometimes ambiguous to know. So we live in this VUCA world. So how do we lead in a VUCA world? How do we lead in a world that is constantly changing? Well, we need to be adept at thinking responding, reacting, and leading on our feet. In short, we need to be able to improvise. So I want to do a quick activity. Uh, you guys have maybe have done this before, depending on your kind of expertise or familiarity with improv, but uh, I want you to, to do it because I think it's a good thing to practice even if you've done it before. I want you to turn to the person next to you, and in that uh, group, quickly determine who has longer hair. <laughs> Some of these are close, right? And they're going to share an idea for a future activity for this entire group. We're going to say, hey, we're going to help Patty and the team plan for uh, the, the fall program. We're going to brainstorm a team building activity. Uh, you guys are in Phoenix in the fall, is that right? Um, so you're going to say maybe something in Phoenix. And so the first person, the person with shorter hair is going to start. They're going to say some type of idea. So they might say, uh, let's see, we're all going to be in Phoenix. So I would say, uh, let's all go to a Phoenix Coyotes game. Is that a team? Is they hockey? I think that's a hockey team in Phoenix. If it's not, we'll pretend that it is. Uh, I didn't have to do my Phoenix research before this. All right? So we're going to go to a Phoenix hockey game. We'll say that. All right? The other person or the next person in the line is going to respond, but their response is going to start, yes, but. All right? You might say, yes, but we probably have some people here who are not hockey fans. Right? You're going to go back and forth or down the line, depending on how many people you have, continuing on, yes, but. Right? So you might say, yes, but it's not really about seeing hockey. It's more about the fun experience and a fun environment. Right? Yes, but hockey tends to be cold, so couldn't we do that fun environment somewhere where it's warm? Right? Yes, but we're going to be in Phoenix where it's going to be like 100 degrees, so we're going to want to be cold. Yes, but whatever it is, back and forth, each new line starting yes, but. Does that make sense? Cool. Go ahead and begin. starting yes and. Does that make sense? Cool. Go ahead and begin.
clap twice if you can hear me. Excellent, very cool. Uh, how was that? Any good ideas? Good stuff coming up? Uh, very cool. Well, congratulations. You all have just improvised. Right? A lot of times people tell me, like, oh, I could never do improv. You all just did. You talked about something that was not planned. You had a structure that you could follow, and you leveraged your expertise, your knowledge, to build something together. That is improvisation. Improvisation is not about winging it. It is not about just making things up off the top of your head. It is about the culmination of your skill set, your knowledge, leveraged and executed in the moment. That's improvisation. And yes and is the fundamental mindset of improvisation. So again, congratulations, you all just improvised. Out of curiosity, by show of hands, how many of you thought yes and was easier? Okay. How many people thought yes but was easier? Okay, great, no right or wrong, right? I want you to think about a little bit about what were the differences that you noticed between yes and and yes but? What differences did you notice? For the sake of time and for the sake of size, we kind of move through this, but think about what those differences were that you noticed. For many of you, you probably say things like, oh, you notice that yes and felt a little bit more positive, yes but felt a little bit more negative, right? Yes and is more here's our idea, and yes, but is more, here's my idea, and then here's what's wrong with your idea. Okay? Feels a little bit different. Uh, a lot of times people say, oh, well, yes, and, like, is about growing, and yes, but is about kind of narrowing down. And that's true, because, like, yes, and can get out of control. Right? You do yes, and long enough, you almost always end up on the moon. <laughs> or in prison. <laughs> or in a moon prison. Yes and, yes but. Other differences that you might notice is, uh, yeah, like you want to high five the other person with yes and, right? It feels more positive, you feel more engaged, you feel more willing to kind of take chances with some of the ideas. You want to like high five the other person with yes but, but in the face with the chair. <laughs> right, yes but certainly feels more combative. What do you think we do more of day to day? Yes and or yes but? Yes but. Why? When you guys like who work in business continuity and risk, we have to say no. Right? This is not to say that yes but is a negative mindset or a mindset that you can't have. We have to say no. Yes but is about efficiency. Yes but is a no. It's a nice way to say no. In improv, we say it's a no in a tuxedo. Right? It's a nice way to say no. And it is efficient. The problem is that it's not always long-term effective. So we think about the benefits of yes and is that it does create a more inclusive organization, more inclusive idea, it helps to build people up, it creates more momentum, more energy, right? It also has a lot of different applications. So we're going to talk about the application of yes and through five kind of key areas. These are the five vital values of leadership or leading on your feet. The first value is vision, the importance of having a vision. Why is that important? Why is a vision important? To know where you're going, right? If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Right? Alice in Wonderland, right? And vision is important because it helps you know where you're going. A vision for an organization or a team is very important because then when disaster strikes, something happens, people then have something to rally towards. Because you're not going to be able to plan for every single contingency, though you all will try. Not going to be able to plan for everything. If they have a vision, they know the direction that they can head. But it's also important to have a personal vision. Because my guess is that you all work far too hard not to know what you're working for. Right? The work that you do, the 48 plus hours a week that you work, is only worth it if it is actually worth it. And if you don't know why, that's when you start to get burned out. That's when something happens and things are happening in the moment, you get a little bit disengaged. That vision is incredibly important. It's also important to recognize that having a vision does not mean having a script. Blockbuster had a script. Kodak had a script. Nintendo has a vision. Anyone know Nintendo's vision? Nintendo's vision is bring people together through play. Nothing to do with video games. Nintendo started out as a card company in the late 1800s. It's evolved, it's adapted over time. It said, this is our vision, and then when things change, we're going to yes and our way to get there. Because yes and is not about being a yes man. 
Right? It's not about that. It's about building off of ideas. It's about saying, yes, this is kind of the current circumstance, and here's what I'm going to do as a result. But having that vision helps you know what direction to go to. We also want to make sure that we have versatility. Right? Improvisers know they need to bring together a diverse group of people. Because as the old management set ad, management adage says, that if two people think exactly the same, one of them is unnecessary. Right? You need multiple ideas. You need different insights. You need different expertise. But we don't always get to pick our team. And we have to recognize that the difference between A team and B team is simply in leadership. Is a leader recognizing that of all the skill sets that we have for this particular thing, this is how we need to operate. We need to yes and people's strengths and weaknesses. We need to leverage what they can do. We need to do things like personality assessments, strength finders. We need to figure out what their Myers-Briggs is, INTJ, or their Disney princess, Pocahontas. <laughs> We have to learn, right? Because leadership is not a hat. It's not one size fits all. Who here knows the golden rule? You guys know the golden rule? What's the golden rule? Do unto others if you had have done unto you, right? Sounds great. You could say do unto. You could say unto. That's cool. Uh, probably the only time you ever say the word unto, um, right? How many of you know the platinum rule? Platinum rule? Platinum rule is treat other people the way that they want to be treated. Slightly different, right? Golden rule, treat other people the way that you want to be treated. Platinum rule, treat other people the way that they want to be treated. The way to think about it is this. Is I love milkshakes. Love them. All right, so if I do something good for you, if you want a reward or thank me, take me out for a milkshake. It would be amazing. So I'm thinking of the golden rule, treat other people the way that I want to be treated. If you do something good for me, then it's like, ah, I'm going to take you out for the biggest milkshake you've ever seen. If you're lactose intolerant, <laughs> that's not a very good reward, right? Treating other people the way that we want to be treated is more efficient. Treating other people the way that they want to be treated is more effective. We have to yes and the moment. Yes and their capabilities, strengths, their desires, their motivations, demotivations, and build from there. Because we get together a versatile team. And when we have that team together, we also need to then be able to express vulnerability. I'm an engineer. This is not kumbaya, let's all hold hands, vulnerability. Right? This is authenticity. This is bringing your human to work. Right? Because it is my guess that many of you are likable people at home. <laughs> and then you go into the workplace, maybe a crisis hits and something changes. Right? You become a robot, you become more like authoritarian. Right? You don't laugh, you don't smile. We are human beings in human roles. And even if the work that we do is very serious, we do some work with the FBI, with the uh, uh, Climate Center for Risk Change, for, uh, with the Red Cross. We do work with serious people, but we understand we're still humans at the end of the day. And one of the things that we as humans need is we need things like laughter. We need resilience, which humor, laughter can provide. We need all those things. We recognize that respect precedes results, when we recognize that we're working with humans. Because it's interesting, because as project managers, we label people as resources, at least I did. We label people as resources, just as money is a resource, and time is a resource, we say human beings are a resource. And over time, we start to forget that the other person on the other side of an email, or the other side of a phone call, or the other side of a conference desk is a fellow human being with human lives and human emotions. We need to have that vulnerability to say that we are human, that we do make mistakes, that we can create something called psychological safety. How many of you have read Smarter, Faster, Better? It's a great book. A couple of you highly recommend it. Charles Duhigg, Smarter, Faster, Better. It's a great audio book as well, if audio is your thing. It's fantastic. But in it, he, he shares some research at Google. Google did a, had a project called Project Aristotle where they wanted to see what makes for the most effective team. They looked at 180 teams, 180 different attributes over the course of two years. They want to see what makes for the most effective team. They did not find it was not certain team size, wasn't exactly 12 people, wasn't leadership style. It was that the teams had something called psychological safety. Psychological safety being defined as two things. One, that people felt like they could be their authentic self at work. They didn't have to show up with a work face on. They could be themselves. And two, that if they made a mistake, they want to be made fun of or reprimanded for it. Right? We 
create psychological safety through yes and. That second piece is also very important. It's the next V. It's vigor. Right? So we have versatility. We have vulnerability. We also have to create vigor. We have to create a growth mindset. Carol Dweck. Right? Growth mindset. If you haven't achieved something, it just means you haven't achieved something yet. That we will grow, that we will get better at time. Because the reality is that failure is data. Failure is data. If we mess something up, it's just data for us to improve over time. Now, obviously, your situations, things are a little bit different. Some of the things that you do, if you fail completely, the entire company could go under. Right? I recognize that. This is more of a mindset that we're talking about, a growth mindset. Failure is data. It's how we grow. Because if we only ever did things that we were good at, that we never failed at, we would never walk. Right? We'd all be crawling around right now. Right? Because the first time we got up to try to walk, we fell. We had to recognize that over time, right, when we're learning something new, when we're implementing a new system, when we're changing um, situations, right, whatever it is, it's going to take time to, to learn something. We do that. We learn that through practice and repetition. And the final B is velocity. Because the truth is, is that knowing matters, but doing matters more. There's a difference between intention and action. For example, you all are investing quite a bit to come here today. Right? In terms of time, in terms of cost, in terms of away, time away from family, time away from work, time away from email and devices. You're investing a lot. The question is, at the end of this conference, what are you going to do differently as a result? Because if we get together when we're in Phoenix and you haven't changed anything over the last six months, why were you here? So the question becomes, what are you going to do differently as a result of today or tomorrow? And that's a growth mindset as well. Each day, what am I going to do differently? How do I grow? How do I continue to get better so that I don't settle into excellent mediocrity? I'm going to give you some suggestions on things, what I, what I think it can be. We're going to start to wrap up, though. This is a recap of what we've talked so far. So maybe your action item might be some of this. Right? Leadership is an attitude in action. An unleader fantasizes, alienates, interferes, or inhibits lies and settles. Leading on your feet is about having a vision, versatility, vulnerability, vigor, and velocity. Right? This is what we've talked about. So we have a few minutes for questions, and then I'm going to end on something. So uh, again, you can go to slido.com, uh, put in hashtag DRGA spring. Feel free to answer some of those questions. Now, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions because we are short on time. But what I will do is through the group, uh, through Twitter, uh, a little bit later in the hashtag GRJ Spring, I'll answer some of the additional questions that come in as well. So that, again, we can kind of engage on social media. You can see that. But if uh, you take that out, go to slido.com, DRJ Spring. Um, you can kind of share your questions there. They're going to be filtering them. And I think we're going to see some. They may, we may not have questions. Uh, if we don't have any kind of immediate questions, that means one of two things. Uh, it means, one, I've explained everything perfectly. Or it means that you're like, yeah, yeah, we get it, we understand, right? Uh, we're focused on something else. Uh, I have a personal philosophy that's called air on the side of awesome. Uh, so anytime that there's a situation that I believe that it could be one or two things, I'm going to err on the side of awesome. So I'm going to assume if there are no questions, it's because I've explained everything perfectly. Uh, right, a mindset. I am also going to be sticking around to about uh, lunch. Um, and then unfortunately I have to head out. But uh, if you see me in the hallway, certainly more than happy to answer questions then. If you uh, want to connect with me, happy to answer questions that way as well. We did have a, I think we're testing maybe a poll. I don't know if that's happening. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so we all know new leaders um, need to know the, the people they are dealing with in your experience. What is the fastest method to know each person on your team? Uh, I think uh, one of the easiest ways to do it is by asking questions. Uh, one of the things as a project manager that I used to do at the beginning of each meeting is that we start each meeting with a simple question. It could be a simple question like, what was the first thing you remember buying with your own money? Or one of my favorite questions is, what is something that you think is true for you that you don't think is true for anyone else in the room? Right? Simple kind of get to know you questions are ways to kind of create these human connections. Another way to, to, to build rapport very quickly is to smile a little bit more. Uh, so when we smile, when we see someone smile, we are primed in our uh, head with mirror neurons to mirror that behavior. So when we smile, someone else smiles, we create a connection. Uh, that's why Victor Borg said the shortest distance between two people is a smile. So think about simple ways to kind of encourage it. And one-on-one, -on -one, asking questions. We know that from Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, the most effective way to build relationships is by getting to know someone, by getting them to talk and then just listening. 
right? So uh, asking questions. What's the worst response slash humor uh, joking in a meeting you've experienced? Um, a lot of jokes that didn't work. Um, here's the interesting thing, though. When people talk about humor, a lot of times they're worried that uh, it's going to be awkward if they say something. And the reality is that I don't know anyone who's ever been fired because of a bad joke. They've been fired because of an inappropriate joke, but not a bad joke. Right? Because a bad joke is something like, um, I once had to, had to miss class because I had hypothermia. I was too cool for school. <laughs> it's a bad joke. Right? But an inappropriate joke tends to be inappropriate because either it has an inappropriate topic, right? so you're talking about things that you would not normally talk about otherwise, it has an inappropriate target, so instead of it being kind of positive, inclusive, you're making fun of someone uh, negatively, or it comes at an inappropriate time. Right? You have to recognize, certainly that would then disaster, um, disaster risk, all that kind of stuff, that you don't want to, uh, if, you know, if something terrible has just happened, Right? And everything is on fire. Maybe don't make a pun about fire right then and there. Right? You can use humor to relieve that stress a little bit later, but you have to recognize that there is an appropriate time. Cool. Uh, we have time for one more. We have another question. Who came up with the phrase excellent mediocrity? So that was Professor Thomas Harrell. Uh, he was a Stanford professor. Uh, he did a longitudinal study of um, Stanford MBA students. And uh, yeah, so you can find out more about him. I think it's Thomas W. Harrell, if you actually do the, the Google search for it. He also coined the term verbal fluency. He said the number one predictor for long-term career success is something called verbal fluency, or the ability to articulate the intelligence that you have. Speaks to the importance of communication. As a project manager, we are told that 90% of our role is communication. That's where humor can be particularly helpful because humor can help you to get people to pay attention can help you to get them to remember things longer. That's the value of humor. And I know we've had humor at some of the, the um, previous uh, uh, DRJ conferences as well. Definitely worth checking out those as resources. Excellent. So like I said, uh, okay, we'll get one. How does an unleader turn things around? What's the first step? Oh, that is a fantastic segue question. What is the first step? That's where we're going to move to. Because uh, I, as I said, as I, I'm a project manager, which means that uh, every meeting starts with an agenda and also means that every meeting has to end on next steps. Uh, so we're going to go to our next steps um, slide there. And uh, I call them action items, though, because I think action items sounds cooler. Right? Uh, here are your action items. Here's my recommendation for potential next steps that you can take. One, start with a vision. Go back to your team. Make sure that you have clarity on what your vision is. It can be for an entire organization, or again, it can be for just your individual team. Visions at multiple levels certainly help. That gives you that direction of where you can go. Two, leverage people's versatility. Do a strength finders assessment or do a personality assessment. Learn what people are good at. You will get disproportional results by investing people's strengths than trying to shore up their weaknesses. Right? The research has shown that. So find out what their strengths are and figure out if they're contributing. One of the biggest questions that P&G had in their employee survey every single year was, uh, are you contributing everything that you could or are we preventing that? Something kind of along those lines. But are you basically being able to leverage your strengths? Make that assessment and see if you're actually doing that. Three, encourage vulnerability. Recognize, again, that we are all humans in the workplace. Add a little bit of humor, add a little bit of fun. The number one reason why people don't use humor at work is they say that their boss or coworkers wouldn't approve. But 98% of CEOs prefer job candidates with a sense of humor, and 81% of employees say a fun workplace would make them more productive. So people want humor, they want joy, they want fun in the workplace. They just don't know necessarily that they can do it. So as a leader, be that person that kind of starts using humor, and you'll see the ripple effect come out. Uh, one of the big takeaways from my program on humor is simply think one smile per hour. Humor in the workplace isn't about making the workplace funny, it's about making it a little bit more fun. So think about one smile per hour. What's one thing that you can do each hour of the day to make things a little bit more joyous, that brings a smile to your face or the face of someone else? Right, so that's one way that you can encourage that vulnerability. Next, you want to build vigor. Create a growth mindset. Right? Create this ability for people to think, okay, if I haven't succeeded, I just haven't succeeded yet. And then finally, create velocity actually do something differently as a result. Go back and create accountability. You all are at an incredible conference. You're going to do some networking a little bit later if you haven't already. Find an accountability person here. Connect on social media and say, hey, let's check in in a month from now and see what we've implemented from the conference. 
or start a Facebook group and just kind of share, here are the main takeaways that I got from this breakout or this general session speaker, right? Knowing matters, but doing matters more. Cool, so I want to uh, wrap up on two things. First thing is uh, I want you to get into another pair, this time ideally with the person you did not just work with. So get into another pair, pair up with another person. Yeah, you're, like if you like went to the left last time, go to the right. If you went like forward last time, go to the back, whatever it is, kind of pair up with someone. In, that, uh, in your pair, uh, quickly determine uh, who has cooler shoes. What they're going to do is they are going to uh, count. They're going to say one. All right. The other person is going to say two, and then the first person is going to th say three. Right. So you're simply counting one, two, three together with two people. Right. So it'd be one, two, three. Right. And the next time you're going to switch who starts first. So then it's going to be one, two, three. Right. So you're just alternating. Uh, you're just counting one, two, three, alternating who starts. Does that make sense? Very simple. All right. Go ahead and begin. Excellent. We'll stop right there. We'll stop right there. Now, for the sake of time, we'll cut it short. We can take that a little bit longer. But one, did you laugh? Yeah. Did you laugh right? right? So again, when we're talking about humor, it's not necessarily about making workplace jokes. It's a human experience. It's getting to know people. It's doing things a little bit differently. Two, you probably messed up, realized it was a little bit harder than you expected. Right? Because you're like, when I, when I explained it, you're like, this is dumb, whatever. Let's go. And you're like, oh my god. We have to recognize that sometimes when we try something new, it will be harder than we expected. Right? That's where the growth mindset, that's where vigor really comes into play, that we need to have that, okay, if I haven't succeeded, it just means I haven't succeeded yet. The other thing is that we know that counting one, two, three is a lot more efficient if you just did it by yourself. One, two, three. Right? Um, sometimes we're going to feel things that, oh, this would be more efficient if I did things myself, but that's not what a leader does. Right? A leader is about creating an organization so that ideally it is better when that person like leaves. At PNG, when you're at the highest echelons of leadership, part of your ratings are based on what the organization looks like after you go on to your next assignment. Because I want to make sure that they're building a leader that is creating an entire organization that can sustain itself, not that it's one individual rock star leading the entire charge. Right? So we have to recognize the value of bringing people together. Couple of quick last things. One, uh, as far as resources go, so if you'd like a handout from um, today, you can check out humorthatworks.com slash DRJ. If you go there, there's a survey, quick survey that just helps me learn how to improve this session. Uh, and you'll get a handout from the day by filling that out. Also, uh, I have a brand new book coming out uh, April 1st called Humor That Works, The Missing Skill for Success and Happiness at Work. If you're interested in this type of work or humor in the workplace specifically, it talks about leadership as well as four other skills in the workplace that we can use humor as a way to be more productive. So you can check that out. That, uh, there's a pre-order link there. It comes out April 1st. There's also a, a sign up for a newsletter and my email address. If you have any questions, want to learn anything, or you're like, hey, I don't believe you about this thing, where's the research or the studies or whatever, more than happy to share that. Just reach out to me. Last thing that I'll say is uh, normally uh, a speaker would close on some type of big, uh, some type of motivational speech tying everything together. I am an improviser, so I did not write one. Uh, but what I did do is uh, I talked with some of you this morning at breakfast. I also walked around the exhibit hall, uh, and what I did was I was looking for lines of dialogue. Um, and they might be slogans, or they might be song lyrics, they might be cliches that we hear within this industry. I've written them down on these pieces of paper. I'm now going to improvise a closing story, uh, working in on some of these ideas into the particular uh, story that I tell. So what is something that you are passionate about outside of work? Yoga. Yoga. Oh, I know a great story about yoga. So this is our closing story about yoga. Once upon a time, 
many, many years ago, there was a little girl named Sarah. And Sarah's dream from the very beginning was she wanted to become a yoga guru. Guru? Master. Yoga guru master. <laughs> that was her dream. But the problem is that Sarah grew up with a little bit of a, a unique challenge in that she had no balance whatsoever. It was actually diagnosed as a medical challenge. She had no balance whatsoever. So when she went to her mom, wobbled to her mom, that first day and says, Mom, I want to become a yoga master guru. Her mom just looked at her with kind of that sincere look that moms always give, and she said, thank you. Next. <laughs> What's your next dream? Because I don't think you can do it. And Sarah was heartbroken. She's like, no, mom, this is truly what I want to do. I want to become a yoga guru master. And her mom was like, all right, listen, if you really want to do it, if you, if you think that's what you want to do, I will try to help you. All right, so I'll enroll you in a class. So she enrolled Claire, uh, Sarah into, uh, uh, Sarah Clara, into this class, uh, this yoga class. And she went for the very first day. And there's students everywhere. They're all little kids. And uh, they weren't very nice kids because the first kid came up to Sarah and looked at her. And she saw her kind of off balance and just looked at Sarah and said, that's never going to happen here. Your whole yoga attempt in this studio isn't going to happen. Sarah felt a little bit defeated, but she didn't want to kind of go back to her mom, so she stayed in class anyway, and she tried the different poses. She tried downward facing dog. She tried sun salutation. She tried peanut and cracker jacks, which I'm assuming is a yoga pose. <laughs> and she failed all of them, but she kept on trying. The yoga instructor afterwards came up to her and like, was like, listen, Sarah, I know it's, it's a, big, a bit of a challenge, but I believe in you. If you want to continue to do this, I will help you. In fact, anytime someone says anything mean to you, you just think, people don't want to pay extra for that. <laughs> right? They don't want to pay extra for having to see you fail. <laughs> right? But I'm not going to charge you extra. I'm not going to make it free because I've got a business to run. <laughs> I'm not going to charge you extra. So you come here as often as you want. So she got a class pass program, and she started going to yoga every single day. She started to get better and better at the yoga poses. She started to work harder and harder. She wrote herself an inspirational message on her mirror that she would look at every single morning so that she could remind herself why she was doing it. On her mirror, it said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a darn. <laughs> I don't give a darn about your balance issues or what the medical doctors say. I don't care about what all the students say. I care about what my dream is, what my vision is for what I want to achieve. And she went every day and she got better and better and she learned all of the poses. She knew every single one of them. And one day the, the teacher knew that he was going to be sick. He couldn't actually make it in so he called Sarah up and he's like, listen Sarah, out of everyone in the class, you know the yoga poses, the routine, the hotness of the room, because that's the thing, right? Uh, you know all that stuff better than everyone else. I want you to do it. And Sarah was a little scared. She's like, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can, but she searched deep inside of herself, and she found the, the strength to do it. She said to herself, stay connected, stay protected. <laughs> There's a slogan over there. <laughs> Stay connected, stay protected, stay connected to what it is that you want to do and you will be protected from everything else. If you have that vision and know what you're going for, it doesn't matter how many times you fail, you'll be protected against that failure because you know failure is data. It's an opportunity to improve. Sarah went on to teach that class and many, many other classes. She became an inspiration for yoga people all around the world. Yogis, I think they're called, or yogans. <laughs> know so much about yoga. Right? She became an inspiration. She started speaking. She got one of those Peloton courses, right? So people would then like, like view virtually all what she would say, and she would end every single one of her programs with a message for the world to see whether they're young or old. She would always tell them, it's a continually changing landscape. <laughs> yoga is continually changing as well. If you can do yoga, you can be a leader in this organization. She went on to inspire millions and millions of people. And when she passed away on her tombstone, she left us one last inspirational message. Right? Because she was an inspiration to everyone. She followed what it meant to be a leader through times of uncertain change. She had a vision of what it is that she wanted to achieve, and she went after it. 
She sought out versatility. She needed a coach, someone that would help her to give her different strengths and opportunities that she did not have. She expressed vulnerability from the very beginning of who it is that she was and what she wanted from other people, and she embraced vigor, the idea that failure is just data. And ultimately, she had velocity. She didn't sit at home on the couch, although it would have been easier for her. She went out into the world to do this yoga class and to inspire people all around the world. She became a leader. She left us one last message to the world. She said, break on through to the other side. <laughs> you all have been fantastic. I've been just having a